David, uh, David Ng is here. He's an IBM alumnus from almost, what, 30 years? Yeah, 28 like, years. Yeah. Um, so, good friend uh, and uh, collaborator with a slow start. <laughs> but um, I'll, let, I'll, I'll let him introduce himself. He's got uh, quite a track record, um, but really excited to have him here visiting and to hear his talk. All right, thanks. Thanks, Raphael. Um, it, it's, it's always interesting being a retired IBMer. If, if you have to exit the company, I recommend exiting as a retiree because um, you get all sorts of benefits, um, like they actually still trust you. So, <laughs> so, so it's really good. So um, I've been doing research um, and it occurred to me that um, on the pattern language stuff, I've been pushing this since 2014, and I'll explain uh, why I've been doing it. Um, but when I talk to people about pattern language, it turns out that they don't know all the history. And so much of this is going to be a history of science talk. Uh, there's actually 50 slides. I'm going to go really quickly. I'm here for a week. I'm here for a week, so I'm, I'm happy to unpack all of this. Um, but the, uh, the, the purpose of this is to get, 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 give you a feel for the domain. And I've been working since 2014 actually trying to push forward the pattern language work. Um, and with PLOP and with PurpleSock. And uh, so there used to be a lot of IBMers over there. Um, there's a few ex-IBMers now. Practically everyone that's been in the field has been retired. So this really is a history of science talk. Uh, for some of, some of you who actually lived through it, um, you'll actually get some of the tides through it. So I've been trying to push um, toward, from pattern language towards an affordance language. The affordance language is in the last two slides. And so I'm actually not going to talk about that, but that's the stuff I've been working on. So just to get a background on myself, um, start, start from the back. So I was at IBM for 28 years, IBM Canada, which does not have a research division. Um, had multiple runs of getting into research in Hawthorne. Uh, led a first of a kind project, which I'll explain, um, which uh, didn't go very far, but it came out much later. Um, and, um, uh, but was at the beginning of IBM, uh, business, uh, of, of uh, IBM Consulting Group, before it became GBS before it changed. So I actually have all that history during that period. Um, when I left, when I retired from IBM, I was asked by some um, uh, unnamed IBMers, ex-IBMers, to start an IBM business partner, which I did. Um, they asked me to be 50% chief scientist. I was 110% CEO, and I said, I didn't sign up for this. Oh, guy. <laughs> so um, I, I extricated myself from that um, and have been uh, per finishing my uh, PhD at Alta University. Uh, and so I actually took some years off and actually wrote it. Uh, I told my wife that I wouldn't do any commercial work until I actually got the manuscript done, which I did. Um, that's now been published as a book, Open Innovation Learning. Uh, and uh, Jim Sporer had written the foreword for me. We can win a lot of stuff in service science together. And so now I've, uh, I've formed a, 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 a new uh, innovation collab in Toronto with two ex-IBMers. And uh, we're still trying to figure out what we're going to do. It's new, uh, but it'll be stuff associated with the book. And so. In my career at IBM, um, if, I, if I go all the way back, uh, when I joined IBM in 1985, I was a dropout in the, from the PhD program at the University of British Columbia, uh, primarily focused on decision support systems. I got hired into IBM to do econometrics for IBM Canada. Uh, so a lot of the stuff, um, uh, uh, Lillian Wu was working on GraphStat, um, came up and we're working on that at that time, so it's a long time ago. Uh, after that, I kind of went into um, a really interesting project with uh, metaphor data interpretation systems where uh, this is predating the, um, the intelligent relationship that IBM had with Apple. And so I was in the midst of all that. And so I go back and I visit on um, uh, where, where the office used to be. And of course, that's where the Google headquarters is now. <laughs> so um, what I want to talk about is essentially three ideas. And I'm really going to go through these quickly. Uh, 1964, 1991, and 2012. Uh, but starting off with Christopher Alexander, notes on the synthesis of form. Upsil 1996, which was quite important, and then um, Alexander's latest work in 2012, which is The Battle for Life and Beauty on the Earth, which has to be the gutsiest title ever, uh, talking about the school that he built in Japan in 1985. Then I'm going to come back inside of IBM a little more, talk about 1993 with the formation of the Hillside Group, where the pattern language started. Um, in 2002 and 2006, we start getting into some of the stuff where a pattern language is at the core of the IBM Global Services method. And you kind of go, does IBS have a method? It did have a method until PricewaterhouseCoopers came over and thought they were supposed to teach us consulting and dissected it. 
So this is the problem, uh, and I don't think that you can actually get IGS method inside of IBM anymore because there were no databases that were eradicated. So the people that understand all of that stuff, um, IBM's been very good about it, moved a lot of it out into, uh, into um, Eclipse, and the Architects Workbench project that Steve Abrams was leading was part of that initiative. So all that stuff is based off pattern language, but you have to have been through all of that to kind of experience and know what it's all about. So from 2014, um, this is where I am now, trying to focus on moving pattern language uh, in specific ways towards wicked messes and service system thinking. So we'll see how far we get on that. Okay, uh, how many people actually know a pattern language book? Okay, this book is available in practically every library in the world, um, in a major library. So uh, 1977, 1979, um, and, and, and um, the, if you're gonna read Christopher Alexander, the way I recommend you read Alexander is you actually start with a 2012 book and work your way backwards. Because he's, he's actually like a scientist, and so he keeps changing his language. And people go, oh, they're trying to figure out what, what he was saying in 1977. And I go, but if you actually look, he actually changes his language. So people are confused. And this is one of the problems I have in the pattern language community is they're all trying to look at this book and say, oh, this is the answer. But they don't quite understand that the pattern language is actually, uh, um, in effect, what in IBM we call the work products, and the timeless way of building is the processes. The timeless way of building is at the foundation of almost all the stuff that happens in agile development. And, and this has to do with the chain of people working on it. The Oregon experiment was him putting it into practice, which is doing the urban plan for the University of Oregon campus. And so he's a builder, he's actually working on stuff and, as he's going along. So patternlanguage.com is still up. Um, Alexander is still alive, but he's no longer active. So at the conferences, they have a few videos from now and then, but I don't think he's even speaking anymore. Um, there's the 253 patterns on towns, buildings, and construction. So that's actually the name of the house. An example of a pattern, and this goes kind of from large to small, pattern 159, light on two sides of every room. And so essentially the idea is that people like buildings have lights on two sides of a room. If you have a narrow room, it doesn't, I mean, it feels funny. So you do stuff like, well, this one actually has light, but you kind of block it off now coming off two sides. So, you know, but that is a pattern in the way they've done it. The pattern, um, uh, as, he, as he describes it, they, you see uh, wings of light, positive outdoor space. It connects to other patterns. And if you have Jacana, this is, a, um, the, now there, there's issues with the pattern language book because now we're working with the technology of paper. We're predating Wiki, and so the only way to publish this thing was to publish it by Oxford um, Press. The books are public by Oxford Press, and they will not release the copyrights on it. So even though the community would love to be able to update the patterns, they can't update the patterns because the copyright is frozen by Oxford University Press. But they've got this uh, extract on it, and so what you can see, the light on two sides of every room, uh, there are higher order patterns, and there are lower order patterns. So they connect together somehow. Here's another one, it's an example, which is um, intimacy gradient. Intimacy gradient is interesting because it's been applied not only in physical space, but also in social space. And so intimacy gradient has this idea, I'll, I'll give you the, the net, is that when you walk into a house, um, very few people make it to the front door. If it's raining, you have the mailman step into the house, you know, get out of the rain for a second, that's as far as he gets. You know, your friends get to the living room, your really good friends may come, the parties always end up in the kitchen. Hardly anyone ever sees your bedroom. So if you go to an intimate gradient where um, you have an apartment and you open up the door, the first thing you see is the bed, it's just weird, right? So that's, that's the sort of thing that the intimate gradient has. And so this sort of thing also applies if you look at social media. And so I've taken this idea because I'm, I'm all over Facebook and you know Google Plus and all the sort of stuff I do when I'm blogging, but there's actually stuff that is my family. So I use Facebook for family. I don't use it like most people. I use Facebook just for family. I use Google Plus for all the stuff that's external, and that's just the way I do it because I understand this gradient. So this is I have this running joke, which is uh, how close are you to David Ng? And the question is, have he, has he cooked for you yet? Because I have this habit of invading people's homes and cooking for them. So. <laughs> um, this is what the pattern language looks like in 1968. Um, this, this is from the pattern manual. Um, and so you see all these patterns are linked together. So why do we want it? Three types of help. Well, so we want the unique features of each special building. It tells which patterns to consider first, which ones to consider later. And you obviously want to do the bigger ones first and work on the details. It tells them which patterns go together. And so the pattern and the language... Um, I, uh, there's one person in the pattern language community who says, 
I want to understand pattern, and then I'm going to understand language. And I go, no, you have to understand pattern language in the way that Christopher Alexander actually expressed it. And then you may want to change that, deviate from that, but the idea of pattern language itself is this network. When you get to focus on just the pattern, you say, oh, I want this just this one thing. It's like, no, you're missing the point. It's a language. Okay, so the definition, and this is from the original Pattern Manual 1967, Alexander founded the Center for Environmental Structure at Berkeley in the architecture program. And the uh, format says whenever there's a certain context exists, a certain problem will arise, the stated pattern will solve the problem, uh, and that, that should be provided in the context. So essentially three ideas, context, problem, so, and, um, and it's solution in effect, which is the pattern. Now this is in 1967, and so you, if you actually do the diligence, you'll find out that the language changes a little bit. Okay, so 1977, 79, 1994. How many people know the Gang of Four book? Okay, now so he, here is where the breaking point is. The Gang of Four book, um, John Felicides was at Hawthorne. He is the guy that actually led the pattern language stuff, and when he died, you can see all of the accolades in the computer science writing saying we lost someone really, really major. Like, really major. He was the guy that was driving all this. Uh, I was working with, uh, with Ian Simmons in IBM Research. He comes up to me and says, I have the world's best programmer working on my team. I go, how could you possibly say that? And he said, I have John Lucidi's on my team. I said, okay, maybe you do have the world's best <laughs> programmer on your team. Because these guys are up at Hawthorne. And he said, literally, what he would do is they, they would hit an intractable problem, and they would call up John and give him the problem, and in 24 hours, it would come back, it would be elegant, and it would be simple. And it's like, you know, how do you do that? I don't know, but this is a pattern line guy. This is how he did it. So, um, so 1994 is when this book came out. In, and in 2005, Jim Copeland was working on um, organizational patterns. And so he's taken the idea that, that comes from architecture, it's gone into software, and he's using that organization. So it gives some history now, um, or some context for this. Jim Copeland, he was at um, AT&T Bell, Bell Labs. He is now the chief methodologist for the Scrum plop movement. So Scrum, he is the chief methodologist. And so you know, what is this guy doing? And they're actually, um, the Scrum plop, um, uh, they have an online community. I see they're actually going to release a book. I think it's called the Scrum book. But he's, all this goes back to all this history. Okay, so this is Copeland's definition, which gets a little more complicated. You have the pattern name, you have a problem, you have the context. Uh, you have the forces. The forces um, is an interesting problem in the description. When you talk about physical forces, it's kind of like, well, you can't put this in front of that because it won't be strong enough to support this. You know, That sort of stuff you get into. But it, it's different consideration or different ways of assembling the pattern. But after you have this and you put a solution to that problem, you end up, end up with resulting complex. He had also suggested that you have to explain why the rationale is done and their related problems. So there's actually lots of forms. And a lot of people go back to the original 1993, 1995 hillside stuff when they start doing the formatting of how do I write a pattern? And, and this is how you do it. So we get to Uppsala in 1996. Christopher Alexander gets invited to Uppsala. This talk is on YouTube. And it gets published in IEEE Software in 1999. And uh, I did a blog post on this because it's actually pretty close until you get to the last third of the book. What did he say in effect? And this is a really, really famous talk. He says, firstly, I'm an architect. I have no idea why you software people are even interested in patterns. <laughs> okay, okay. But then he looks at what they're doing and saying, you guys have missed the point of patterns. What you guys are doing is using the pattern language to write software in a more efficient way. That's not what it's about. The reason we use patterns in architecture is for beauty. We're trying to get to a higher aesthetic. And we want things to change the world. And so, so this gets into the issue of what we call quality without a name. And so um, Richard Gabriel is an interesting guy. This book is available. Uh, I call him one of the gods of computer science. Now, in 2014, when I started looking, well, what's this guy doing? Because he's one of the founders of PLOP, Pattern Language of the Programming Conference. Turns out he's at IBM. It's like, oh, well, that's a really long and narrow route. And then I start contacting him. Jim Spore helped me contact him. And he's like, wow, this is an IBMer who doesn't even answer his email. You have to go to his external email. So anyway, um, mm -hmm. the idea that he was looking for in, in what Alexander calls is quality without a name. 
So how, why is it the building feels great? So why does this feel good to be here in this room? And you can ask the same sort of questions about the software that you're building. Why is the software great? Like, what is it about the design? So um, uh, I, was, uh, I was telling Raphael that um, Gabriel has this interesting um, article he's famous for. It's called Worse is Better. And so his argument, do you want great software or do you want bad software? You actually want bad software because if it's bad and you're learning, you can actually improve it. If it's great, you're stuck. There's nothing you can do to people go, oh, it's great, don't touch it. But then the world changes, right? Um, and the same sort of thing happens with um, Ward Cunningham, who invented the wiki, and Ward is asked, does wiki have to be ugly? And he says, yes, it has to be ugly, <laughs> because if it's beautiful, people will not edit a page. <laughs> so these are sort of things that come out of Christopher Alexander's thinking and, and through the community. So over 50 years, Christopher Alexander has done these. So you start off with... No time of synthesis of form. He talked about the process of design and goodness of the fit. In 1965, he writes, the city is not a tree. Um, and this is talking about a mathematical semi-lattice. So when you're connecting those patterns together, how do they connect? It's not a strict tree. It is a lattice because the bottom nodes connect to each other. 67, the pattern manual, at, uh, which starts at Berkeley. 68, a pattern language generates multi-service center. That's the first work, and I like using this, particularly for service science, because what he says in it is, okay, so... Um, we're back in the ni in 1960s, and they haven't figured out in government yet that when uh, you're giving city, city services for people who are uh, homeless, you have to give them medicine, you have to give them child care, you have to give all these sorts of things. I'm going to design a building where we bring all these properties all together into one building. That was revolutionary back then. He also says, I'm not an organization guy. I don't do any organization stuff. My patterns are about the building, and so, um, so that's, what, that's what happens there. Um, there's an article in 1967-68 called Systems Generating Systems where he is a um, now trying to explain the systems theory behind what he's doing. Now, I wish he had participated more with the systems community. Um, I was president of the International Society for System Sciences, and Jim was one of my speakers at the conference at San Jose State in 2012. Uh, and we have a whole community that understands biology and sociology and all these sorts of things. He's coming at it from purely a physics standpoint. And so he's trying to get this idea of generated systems and systems as a whole. Um, 77, the pattern language book, Timeless Way of Building. Uh, he wrote The Origins of Pattern Theory. He's working out the Opus Magna is actually this, the 2002-2005, uh, The Nature of Order. Uh, it's a four-volume book on what is order. And, and people try to understand how that fits in, and they don't quite understand. And so you've got these papers underneath about complexity theory, sustainability, and morphogenesis, generative codes, and then empirical findings from the nature of order, because he's trying to be a scientist. You know, I have these patterns, I have the way, this way of seeing the world, how is it actually working out? So um, the problem that I've been having with the pattern language, pattern language community is they're all frozen back here, and they're kind of going, oh, we, we pick and choose stuff from up here. And I'm going, uh, you need to understand what it is that he was doing. He was increasingly, increasingly working on spatial stuff, physical geometry, which doesn't necessarily apply to software and it doesn't apply to social systems. So if you're taking that case, you, you should stop and uh, do a little reflection on that. Okay, so let's switch to the second part, Hillside Group. Um, how many people know that Ward Cunningham invented the wiki? Okay. Ward Cunningham invented the wiki specifically to create pattern language. Ward Cunningham's in Portland, Oregon, so he's not the guy who invented Wikipedia, but he invented the wiki technology specifically for the design patterns movement. And IBM, like he, uh, what Ward said, is that there were as many people inside IBM working on design patterns as there were outside of IBM. That was how big it was at IBM. So the design pattern stuff, this is actually uh, really old, so this is probably like 95 when they have this sort of stuff. And eventually the Hillside Group, which was formed in 1993, um, they have their own website, you know, hillside.net. It still looks the same. They have, they're not very good about updating stuff, but they moved some of the pattern stuff over, um, so they have their own website. Um, 1997, this is where I led a first-of-a-kind project. Um, I had to dig up these slides. It's pretty interesting. In 1997, this was a uh, Watson Research with Consumer Driven Supply Chain. That's a retail industry unit that doesn't exist anymore. Um, it was a really interesting endeavor. It took me nine months to get to the general manager of Ivan Consulting Group, and he asked, why are you here and what do you want? The guys in the research folk want you to say, okay. 
Is that what they want? They don't want money? They don't want, no, they want to say, okay. He says, okay. And I went back to the folk people and said, thank you very much for improving our process. It took nine months to get a folk, folk approval. They say it's supposed to mean easy win, easy kill. It takes my money. So, so that's the way the folk was. Um, but the idea was that we would have a technology and we would have a supply chain reference model built there. Um, we were working with Steve Heckel on the managing by wire idea. Executable business models is originally what they were called. Enterprise builder with the technology. We had the marketing models because we're working with industry, and we had um, alignment with um, the enterprise support systems cross industry product people. So I was leading this project, and the reason they got killed was it really one of those IBM things that happened. Ron Osepian, who was leading this, was in Boston, and he says the way that IBM Finance wants to do this, the funds that are going to research, they have to flow through my business unit. If they flow through my business unit, I will lose money. I will kill this project before I allow this money to flow through my business unit. The project was killed. So we started all this work and we never we were prepared to go to the first customer and get sign up. Stop. Thank you. Okay. So 1998, while I'm still on this project at Oopsla, there's a system envisioning workshop. Uh, Ralph Hodgson was consulting to IBM, Tom Bridges from IBM Canada, uh, Doug McDavid was enterprise architect. And so I was there, I wasn't one of the original people, but at that point we we're looking at system imaging technologies and discussing this in 1998. Um, Kai, uh, in, uh, in 97, so you have uh, Rachel Bellamy, I think she's still around, Thomas Erickson just retired, um, John Thomas just, uh, he retired a couple years ago, and, and you have this idea, Tom Erickson wrote this paper, Lingua Franca for Design, Sacred Pattern, the Sacred Places of Pattern Language. So, these people are actually all interested in continuing to have the discussion on pattern languages, if you really want. Um, 2002, this is an article by John Cameron on the IBM Global Services Method. It's published. And so that's why I can actually talk about it to everyone. It's published. And so what is in this thing? You have a work products. What was the problem that IBM had? In the era of object orientation, you had the Boots method, you had the Rumba method, you had the Jacobson method. And IBM is going up to clients and saying, we want to do this. And they go, okay, but we just did the Schleier-Meller method. And so it's trying to rationalize this, literally because IBM would come out and do a management consulting project and, and say, this is your strategic direction, here's your IT strategy. And then the IT implementation people come and say, we need to do this IT strategy work. He said, IBM, I just paid you half a million dollars to do that. What, why don't you guys talk to yourselves? because I'm not gonna pay you again to do strategy work you've already done. And that was fundamentally why the work product-based method came about. And meanwhile, we've got progress on the Architects Workbench project, IBM Systems Journal. There is a technology that was developed. It didn't become a product um, in, in the way that we look at it. It actually was part of the rational tool set, and you see elements of it kind of hanging around, but this thinking is there, but it's forgotten, right? So, 2007, Eclipse, one of open unified process. This is the IBM Global Services method externalized. Now, I just checked. Open, this page is on archive.org. It is not on Eclipse anymore because no one uses it. So there was actually tooling available that was developed and all the stuff is there. So what's it look like? Here is what it looks like. So we're in the, the, Eclipse, uh, the Eclipse process framework composer is actually the tool. And there was a rational um, uh, tool that was associated with this. But you have work content, you have work coordination, you have the work products, it has all the activity processes, all the estimation. This is how you run a consulting engagement. And it was all worked out, 2006, wiped out of IBM. With the acquisition of PricewaterhouseCoopers, who said, okay, well, you know, IBM, we, you bought us because you must have thought that we were, you guys don't know how to consult it. IBM was doing consulting fine before PricewaterhouseCoopers came in, and now the reason we don't have a method is because they didn't understand all the stuff that had been done in research before to develop all this, right? So IBM, in 1992-93, hired, uh, hired um, uh, a principal from Booz Allen actually to teach IBM consulting. So I'm one of those IBMers. And the, and, and the practice leader came in and said, we have all these really smart IBMers and they have no skills. You guys want to go into consulting? Okay, we're going to teach you. Three weeks of consulting school, two weeks of methodology training. So 
I'm a certified IBM consultant, actually not once but twice, but it doesn't mean anything. Okay, pattern language. So um, interesting, John Thomas, who just retired, who retired a couple of years ago, has started blogging again on pattern language. So March 2nd. Um, and um, he also received a Sikai Lifetime Service Award. People like that. So you know, this guy's around. He's in San Diego. You want to talk pattern language? He wants to talk pattern language. He really wants to talk pattern language. Now, he and I have not talked about this stuff because I'm going a different direction from him, but he is a traditional approach. That's, that's kind of extended from what you see in research. Okay, 2014, where am I? And I'm trying to go on with wicked problems and service system thinking. So um, in two, 2016, um, I wrote this paper for the Perl conference. Um, this is an architecture conference. This is not a software development conference. And my proposal was that we should do service system thinking. Um, so uh, in this paper, which very few people have read, but I love to discuss with people. They have the ideas. Alexander had some great ideas, but it doesn't apply for everything. It doesn't apply to social systems. He is a building architect, and when I deal with the people in the conference, they go, well, we know nothing about software. That's not what we do for a job. We know nothing about services. We don't do that. So um, we have service science coming in. This is a typical um, uh, Institute for Manufacturing definition. We have services. What's different about services is that it is interactive. The stuff that Alexander was looking at, you have the building and the building sits there and it's non-interactive. So we need to adjust the way that we look at pattern language and move towards something more interactive, which is not only just about the way that we manage software, but this is where all the design stuff comes in because design as a field itself move from product design into interactive design. So you have the same sort of split happening in the design community where, okay, you, you, and, and service science is kind of where, where that comes. So going back in history, I'm now back, this is a blog post um, that I have, on Christopher Alexander, Horst Riddle, and Wes Churchman. These are three professors that are all at Berkeley in the late, uh, in, in the 60s and into the 1970s. And uh, what I've been doing, in effect, is going through and working with all their grad students. The grad students are retired now. That's how long this is. Okay, Wes Churchman, he joined Berkeley, um, and he's one of the founders of Operations Research. That's how old he is. He was leading the Space Sciences Laboratory um, and eventually retired into Peace and Conflict Studies. Uh, he, is, he is Russell Acoff's PhD supervisor. He was also Ian Mitroff's PhD supervisor. I'm going to see Ian on, um, on Friday. He lives up in uh, Oakland. And um, all this stuff is there uh, where we have, in effect, the whole systems movement there. Horst Riddle was hired at the same time as Alexander into the same college. And from Thorne Mann, who's one of the grad students, he's actually a, uh, a TA for Horst Riddle. He says, both Alexander and Riddle were at what time was called the design methods movement in architecture. And these guys are in the same building and Churchman's in the building next door. And so these guys go out to lunch. And so my question is, what are they, what are they talking about lunch? You know, how much can you take from one to the other? You've got Churchman working on social systems You've got Riddle, who's focused on um, environmental design, but he's really an urban planning kind of guy. And you've got Alexander, who is a building architect. Okay, so I mentioned Alexander's 1968 systems generating system. So why am I interested in Alexander and system thinking? You have the idea of a system as a whole and a generating system. System as a whole is not an object, it's actually a system. Generating, well, what do you mean by generating? But his idea was that a functioning building, the building and the people in it together form a whole. So this is a guy, architect, that actually recognizes that people live in buildings, which is good. The people, they're architects that, you know, build, that don't consider the people in them. But that's where you design the system. And so he's saying that the building systems created so far have, do not generate holes at all. Okay, what do you mean by generating a hole? A hole what? And that's a lot of the language you end up working with around Christopher Alexander. Riddle, on the other hand, wrote this article uh, in 1973 called Dilemmas in a General Theory of Planning. This is actually published by Wes Churchman in Management Science um, about two or three years earlier. Uh, and, he's, and Churchman cites Riddle and then a couple of years later um, publishes it. But he came up with an idea of what are called wicked problems. People know wicked problems. They've heard of the term wicked problems, right? Uh, the problem is that people that actually have read the, that have talked about wicked problems and say they're going to solve a wicked problem, 
they don't understand what a wicked problem is because a wicked problem is not solvable. So there's a lot of people writing now about solving wicked problems. It's like, no, this is wrong. Uh, what you need to do is go back and read the original article. There are 10 distinguishing properties of planning type problems. So a tame problem, you could do an exhaustive formulation. You can figure out mathematically what it is, but there's no definitive formulation of a wicked problem. You go to everybody and ask what's the problem, and they have a different answer. So all the stuff that deals with, um, with social systems and how you actually deal with a problem in social systems. So go through 10 of them. Um, churchmen is, is focused on the systems approach. The system approach is puts in morality, religion, and aesthetics into the system. And the reason is that the systems approach has rationality in it, but you have to use the rationality with the other things combined. So he actually suggests that you have to face the reality of these other enemies and deal with the enemies because if you're not dealing with the enemies you're not taking a systems approach and the problem is the reality of the enemies cannot be conceptualized approximated or measured um, churchman was a professor of metrology the philosophy of measurement and the question is can you measure something and so if you're looking at is this a better system what he's in effect saying is there are parts of the system that you create that are not measurable and no matter what you say, it is not measurable. So I'm, I'm trying to change the language a little bit from um, the idea of a wicked problem to a wicked mess. Ian Mitroff used the term wicked mess. Uh, a, a mess, uh, a, a, a mess is traditionally called, uh, formally called, problematique. It is a system of problems. You have a system of problems, a dynamic system, complexity, and you, in order to get a so, uh, a solution or moving forward, actually intervention is a better term. In order to have an intervention, you will fix some things in a mess and they'll create other problems and then you have to fix those ones, right? But it's a choice you have, it's a never ending thing. Okay, so um, this is one of the advantages of going. So in last, um, uh, last October, I went to Purple Sock, which was in Austria, then I went to Plop, you know, which was ACM in Vancouver, it was Flash. And uh, this is Max Jacobson. This is one of Alexander's grad students. Um, he's now retired. He is one of the co-authors of A Pattern Language. And I have him on the audio recording saying, pattern language is not for wicked problems. Okay, so I have a whole community now called Purple Sock, which is on social change. They're using pattern language for wicked problems. I'm going, you guys need to rethink this a little bit. Think a little deeper because if you think that everything that can be organized like a physical space, then you're, you're off. Um, and so that was a really valuable thing for me, that uh, to have one of the authors of a pattern language saying, you're doing this kind of all wrong. Um, we get into complexity. What is complexity and complicatedness? Um, let me give you the, uh, the, uh, exa the simple example, the Lister example. An egg is a complex system if, if you beat it. So if you have yolk and you have white, it is complicated because you can take it apart, put it back together. Once you beat the egg, it's a complex. Okay, that's a simple explanation for the formal definition. In the systems theory and complexity area, a lot of people start getting into, can we measure complexity? That's the wrong question. Complexity is like, can you measure how much the egg is beaten? It's like, well, no, the question is whether is it still egg white and egg yolk? And should you beat them together and create a complex? But talking about how well it's mixed, like, uh, I don't know. So we start getting these sorts of definitions from systems theory that um, start getting, sort of tripping us up. Now, one of the things that I've been doing is moving away from, uh, from the idea of systems going inside to going outside. And I've been leaning a lot on uh, what's called ecological anthropology, ecological psychology. And ecology doesn't mean what you think it means. So let me, let me go through this definition. So um, the best way of describing the ecological approach is ask not what's inside your head, but what your head is inside. If you go back to the period of uh, the 1950s, this comes in behavioral psychology in Pavlov's dog. Okay, we ring the bell, the dog salivates. How do you explain that? You ring the dog, you know, so you kind of have this thing going on where you're trying to get inside the head of the, um, of the dog and understand that. There's an alternative approach, which is the ecological approach. James Gibson was studying pilots. And what he's asking is, how does a Navy pilot land an aircraft on a carrier? 
Okay, no matter how much you get inside this guy's head, it's not really going to help. You got both things moving at the same time, so how is it you do that? That is the ecological approach, and to do that, he created the term affordance. Now, I've been suggesting that we might look at these, um, and, and the way I've been doing this, in service science, I've been suggesting that you might design affordances in, in, the, in this way. So you could have a, a high, um, high ability and a low ability person. So if we're coming into this building, as an example, so there are steps. If there are steps, a high ability person can actually walk up steps. It's not a problem. A low ability person in a wheelchair or on crutches, I just had Achilles tendon, so I was on crutches, I get all the stuff up front, um, starts having challenges. So do you design a one system that handles both the high ability person with affordances or do you design two systems? Either one is valid. You go to a hospital, they have an emergency room specifically for special cases and they run it differently. So that is a, a, a complicated system. You run emergency separate from outpatient, but you can also have a complex system where everything comes in together and you have to deal with that. This has led me into ecological anthropology. Uh, Tim Ingold, um, and this is where the research part of me comes in. So he, uh, Tim Ingold was invited to the IFIP meeting at the end of 2017, so IFIP Working Group 8.2, which is a social theorist for uh, computer science. And so I went throughout it through Dublin, um, and he gave this talk, but this is an interesting paper. So what's the difference when you start looking at things from the ecological perspective? And he has what he calls human correspondence, which I prefer to call co-responding, because it's, it's agents responding to each other. So you need to understand that, that human beings operate on habit rather than volition. So when you are walking, are you walking or is, or, or is a walking you? You get into these sorts of issues, because you don't think consciously about walking. Um, agency rather than inter, the, rather, agency rather than agency, and he talks about, um, in effect, you know, coordinating between people. And the way that you depict this is two people going together to the beach, as an example. So they're there together. They're not joined together necessarily, but they work together. And finally, attentionality rather than intentionality. And so you actually get a group together. This group is jumping into the pool. Their concern is not whether they're going to hit the pool or not. Their concern is whether they're going to run into each other. And so they're paying attention to each other. The in intention of getting into the pool is actually secondary to the attention. This is sort of stuff that happens when you work on the ecological approach. Now, we have the same sort of thing happening in, um, and this is uh, Kelly's uh, 2000, 2015 paper, when we talked about the cognitive era, because we're moving towards an area, a, a domain where it's actually more ecological. So when you start talking about um, virtual uh, augmented reality. And augmented reality, you need that, side, that type of ecological approach to, to keep yourself straight because the philosophy has changed. So I, what I'm suggesting is that we're going through another turn in philosophy. It's going to be called a material turn uh, because there, there's a lot of interest now in research being done on makers. And the makers make things real. And so that's the turn we're looking at. Um, I have a pattern for... Uh, for um, um, service system thinking. Uh, I'm not going to go through it uh, so much now, but let me give you an idea about it. Uh, the pattern label, um, voices on issues, you want to know who is related to uh, the service. Um, in the Alexander patterns, everyone is treated the same. Alexander has this idea of Turkish carpets. And there's a carpet on the left and there's a carpet on the right. Which one do people like more? And this is uh, a uh, one that Richard Gabriel actually does quite often. He says, you know, Everyone agrees that the carpet on the left is more beautiful than the one on the right. It speaks more to them. Except the computer science people who like the one on the right. And he says, then the computer science people must be wrong. And I'm going, um, not if it's consistent. If it's a service orientation, it's not just about the carpet. It's something in the human being. You have to be concerned about the interaction. So we want to get people put into the pattern language. Uh, the affording values, you want to know why it's put in. The spatial temporal frames. What happens is that we end up looking at Heidegger and, and interpreting Heidegger. So when Heidegger wrote um, about place and uh, being, he, a lot of people interpret that as being in a single place. So in your building, it's kind of like, oh, this is a great building. I'm experiencing it. But they don't. He, it, Heidegger actually doesn't um, exclude looking at the building over time. But when philosophers look at being, they don't necessarily look at becoming. 
So how does this building age over time? How does it change? The feel change over time? These sorts of things that we should take into consideration on spatiotemporal. Uh, we have containing systems that are slower and larger, and we have contained systems that are faster and smaller. So the original one where I showed you all the patterns are all connected. We need to recognize that when we're doing stuff, we need to always have that bigger system and smaller system at the same time. And I've done this for some examples, which I'm not going to go into so much, um, minding children in, in, the, uh, in the center. Now, Ward Cunningham, and this started in 2011, created Federated Wiki. Has anyone seen Federated Wiki? This is an interesting technology, and the question is, what is wrong with Wikipedia? Wikipedia is based off a single, a single inquiring system, the inductive consensual inquiring system. And what that means is, if everyone agrees the world is flat, the world is flat, because it also has that Wikipedia. Um, I'm actually running down run now. I've been I've been holding off on one. There's uh, on the Gestalt page. Someone cites um, Kafka saying uh, the whole is is greater than the sum of the parts. Actually, what he said was the hum is, the whole is different from the sum of the parts. But what's happened is people are now citing the Wikipedia definition because that's what they see and everyone thinks it's correct. It's like no, it's actually wrong. So what Ward has done is tried to figure out how is it that you have multiple perspectives, multiple realities actually baked into a federated wiki. And the idea would be that you could actually go and uh, have people update pages and have backlinks. So if someone modifies my page, I know they've modified it. And he's been doing it. And now go to node npm install wiki. That's how easy it is. But people aren't using it because they don't quite understand it. Um, I've been trying to, uh, I've, I've been involved with him and I did some of the stuff. So I did uh, a wiki, a federated wiki with the pattern language stuff in it. Um, and I put some of the stuff in there. So I had some experience with it. Um, like to have discussions about how we might take this a different direction because there's stuff missing in it. In particular, the thing about wiki, if we're talking about um, co-responding and, and thinking about those arcs, when, when you're drawing the semi-lattice, all the circles, these are all the circles. Where are all the edges? Where are all the connections between them? They're invisible. But on a pattern language, it's actually what ties everything together, and that's what's important. And we're missing it because it's just buried there. They're invisible. Um, what I've been looking at recently, uh, this is the system biology graphical notation. Um, so these guys looked at UML. They looked at SystemML from the systems engineering community. And they're saying, this is not enough biology. We actually need better modeling tools, and this has been working since 2006. Now, I haven't actually looked at this. Hopefully, we'll have an opportunity to look into this. What does this have that UML doesn't have? Metabolism. It has the idea of time built into it. So whether you're looking at living systems or whether you're looking at software that's going to evolve, learning software, AI learning, augmented intelligence stuff, metabolism or time is going to play a factor. And so since these people have already done the work, I'm going to try to rest on their shoulders. And the theory is coming. Um, this is a, a 2014 publication by Tim Allen, who was a speaker at the 2012 meeting. He's the former president of the ISSS. And uh, he also writes with um, Jan Petro, uh, Mary Jan Petro. But we're into holons. And this is what I'm reading right now. I'm actually on the airplane. I was reading Arthur Kessler, holons, the, the, the book. Uh, kind of trying to get the definitions. In the ecology literature, holons have become a really big deal. So a holon is both a part and a whole at the same time. It's like, oh, what's that mean? How do you model that? So that's the sort of stuff I'm interested in working and discussing while we're here. So on a different track, um, I'm just going to wrap up now. Uh, this is the book that uh, we published. Uh, it's on openinnovationlearning.com. Uh, it is available as a free download unless you want to pay for Amazon. I think I have a whole dollar now. I've earned a dollar since February. Because uh, you can't charge zero on Amazon. I, I try, actually, you, you could charge the lowest price. The, the best way to get this is actually on Kobo. You go to Kobo and download it, and the PDF render is fabulous. So thank you for your time. I will be around for uh, a whole week. If there's any ideas that spark and you want to talk, um, I'll be hanging around Raphael so you can find me. Thanks. And five minutes for questions, I guess. Is there any, uh, so you, you skip a, a couple of uh, slides about the, uh, the, the patterns and the, the format and so forth. So can you give us some examples that you have worked through? Okay, so yeah, um, yeah I'll go back to this one. Yeah. Um, okay, right, right. so yeah, so this one. 
Um, so the original pattern that, uh, that came from Alexander, essentially the idea was that you would come into a multi-service center and he didn't want uh, a person behind a hole in the wall desk sort of formality. And so what he wanted was to have uh, a person with a clipboard and come and say, why are you here today? Do you need to see a doctor? Do you need housing? Oh, uh, oh, I see you have children with you. Why don't I take your children and put them over in the play area over there? And so there's this pattern that I have converted because he's concerned about the physical space. And so he says, okay, uh, for the uh, child minding area, it, ha it should be visible. As soon as you walk in the door, you want the, the um, client to be able to see, oh, that's where my kids go. Send the kids over there. It's supervised. It, it uh, suits, you know, uh, five-year-olds up to 12-year-olds, this sort of stuff. That's the pattern. But socially, he doesn't say anything. So let's change that to social. What's it mean in a social sense? So voices on issues. So how, minding children. So for a client, what services are available to me now on an appointment? So I come in, and it's like, that's the question that I want to know. That's the answer, what I want. For a parent, what can I do with my kids while I'm busy? For a child, what can I do while my parent is at the multi-service center? So you need to put the actual roles back into the pattern language. Because right now, Christopher Alexander, it's like, the building is beautiful. It's beautiful for everyone. You kind of go, I don't know if the children really care about the beauty, right? Uh, affording values. So um, leaving a children in a supervised area so the whereabouts are known. Availing distractions for toddlers' routines so coming to parents is less of a chore. What is the value of that service? Uh, because he doesn't do value per se. Um, Spatio-temporal frames, when and where does it matter? The facilities and programs are known both to children and parents in advance of appointments. They're not even going to come into the building if they don't know that there's child care because if you've got a homeless person with a child, like, what am I going to do with my kids? I have a doctor's appointment. And it's like, well, no, it's, it's all there. Oh, it's actually there. Then you have to advertise or, or promote it some way or put it on, on the outside of the building. But then the people have to know. The community have to know. Oh, don't worry about it. Just, take, just go there. They handle everything, right? The containing systems for the extended family, schools, and community workers, what personal responsibilities inhibit service engagement. So now it's not just the uh, parent who's there for the child care. You start getting into the city. Well, how does the city relate to this? How do, how do health, you know, all these other services? And then you get the faster and smaller. For other parents at the multi-service center, would you look after my kids while I look after yours? So do you actually need to staff a multi-service center? Does it require more money? Now you're getting reductive. So um, this, is, this is one that's in the paper that I had written in 2006, just trying to give an example. But if we were to do a pattern language service systems, like, I'm not wedded to this. This is my first stab at trying to say buildings and the way Christopher Alexander wrote the pattern language, problem, context, solution, not enough. We need to do that a different way. Along those lines, I'm curious as, I mean, there's so much that's borrowed from architecture, which is really interesting. There's so much architecture theory out there. Yeah. Um, but not, not, not as recent, but computational design has yes. been exploding yes. um, from a practitioner standpoint. Yeah. Um, especially with things like 4D printing now. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any um, theory behind that in terms of how architects, are architects, well the question I have is, are architects using pattern language still uh, from a theoretical standpoint? And if so, has there been any evolution of it uh, in terms of thinking about it from Okay, so the uh, system generating systems paper, um, the place finally got republished is in a computational system, computational architecture book. So that, that so they are interested. Firstly, the pattern language is not widely used in architecture. A lot of people misunderstand it. Um, and in essence, the challenge comes whether they understand system theory or not. Uh, because if you understand what it's doing or why it's doing it and how things are put together, that's like, oh, it kind of makes sense. Uh, but if you're coming at it from a different point of view, it's like, why are they doing this stuff? Like, you know, they, so the, the, the joke originally, and, and one of the other presentations I have, um, in architecture in the 1960s, before Alexander wrote the book, there was a book that came out called Problem Seeking. And the idea was architects do architectural programming. And this is, you think about what software architects do, but the idea was that you do problem seeking before you do problem solving. Architectural programming is problem seeking finding system, systems worth fixing, right? After you've got that, you can do the problem solving. And so when we start talking about the problem seeking, 
all this stuff kind of ties in with the stuff that's happening in design. I was talking, uh, saying uh, about um, why there's a connection between design thinking and system thinking. And that's why they have the attraction. Because design thinking is focused on the problem solving, not so much on the problem seeking. Yes? Uh, yes, regarding uh, to my reference to uh, modeling practices in the field of biology, and, uh, have you taken a look at the collaboration between genotype and phenotype also regarding this repeat method? Yes, in systems theory, yes, and that's language that hardly anyone understands, but that's exactly, exactly the sort of thing that we're looking at. And so, uh, in the book that I wrote, um, Yes, that, that distinction is actually there. Okay. And so, yes, definitely. So how did you come up with this, uh, uh, this uh, use case? Uh, is it yeah, probably related to what Raphael is saying? So it sounds very familiar with the, uh, the whole design thinking process well, of just be considerate of uh, uh, users and, and yeah. take their perspective and, and empathetic to their yeah. needs and so forth. Yeah. So, so part of this is um, is BDD, um, behavior driven design. Right. And so, see, I understand that because I was a consultant doing ID strategy at IBM, so I go all the way up and down the line. But um, this is consistent. So the idea would be, could you actually create a language that is more consistent that goes directly into BDD, which goes directly into Agile? It's like, yes, you can. But now you're you're talking to management consultants, and management consultants, what pattern language? I don't know what that is. So now we're back into the period of IBM Global Services method, where it's like, okay, we have the management consultants who aren't talking to the implementation people, and we're charging customers five times for the same work product. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, how do you think this piece of work uh, is going to be used? So, um, do you think it's a predictive uh, type of? Uh, prescriptive or, or, or predictive type of uh, usage or, or it's after the fact and then you can use it to describe and analyze. Okay. There, there's a difference, right? Yeah, so, no, big difference. Yeah. 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 So, so this comes down to the divide between the Hillside Group and the Gang of Four Design Patterns book. Ralph Johnson, one of the co-authors, will actually tell you, if you sit down with them, that they're coincidental. They did not work together. The Design Patterns book came out at the same time. But the Design Patterns book is a catalog. It is not a language, per se. Right. Christopher Alexander, in the 2012 book, when he describes how he created the, um, uh, the high school, supposed to be a high school university combined in, in Japan, uh, he, he, uh, the reason I like it is he actually goes through and, and does a pattern language for that community. So his idea was that you create a pattern language every time. So you know, every building you go to, there's a new pattern language. Does that mean it could be reused? Yes, it could be reused. Would you start getting into, now, now, see now you're getting into, okay, you got all these circles and arcs. How many circles are there? How many arcs are there between the circles? You're, you're in fact uh, into the problem of Ivan Global Services method. How many ways are there to model it and will customers pay for all these different ways? Kind of like, no, after a certain point they say, it's all the same. So you're, to answer your question, it could be used both prescriptively and descriptively it depends on how you want to approach it. And it's valid either way. Like if you get two client engagements that are exactly the same, two services designed the same way, it's kind of like, yeah. But then you start talking about, well, how much is it different? And, and when you say different, this is when I start getting into, let's understand affordances in a deep way and understand what that language really means. Because, um, so teaching in design classes, it's really funny to ask, you know, how many design students at a master's level, how many have heard of the word affordance? And it's like one hand goes up. So it's the same sort of thing. I talk about pattern language to computer science people. I talk to designers and say affordance. It's like, okay, we need a little more education on this. Can you say more about the difference between a catalog and a language? Okay. So um, the, the, um, the catalog is focused a little bit too much on the parts because if you think of it as a system, so the design patterns book is a system. It's meant to use as a whole book. If you start taking pieces out of that book, it's like, well, you're taking the engine out of a car or you're taking the lungs out of a, uh, a system. Well, is that still valid? Well, you, know, you could try taking the lungs and putting them into your body, but it may or may not work. So the idea that Alexander had was, no, I'm working on a specific project. Um, there's actually now um, 
one of the better papers, one that Jim Copeland liked, Jim Copeland is, uh, doesn't like the way the uh, plot community is working. There's a pattern, uh, there's an idea of a project language. And this came from Alexander late in his career and the um, Japanese architect he's working with. So in Japan, they have pattern language and project language where you'd have pattern kind of as the, the grander sort of thing, like the book, and then you get down to the project and you work on it and you, you modify it. But then you ask, well, you know, how does the project feed back into the pattern? And you go, yeah, that's the interesting question. So it's a methodist issue. I think, so catalog to me is like a for probably inexperienced uh, practitioners when they when they do a design or, or implement something it's a, it's a reference to say oh, am yeah. I missing anything right yeah so to make sure the, the 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 system is complete but to your point the the mechanisms that the mechanisms that uh, connect all these parts it's probably not not, not there right so well so so given that I was an IBM solution architect business architect I've worked in that so the IBM reference models are really great but you need to, the customers need to understand the reference model is a reference. It is not the design, right? It is a reference, and then you can modify from that. So pattern language could be the same way that we have the pattern reference and the project language. We could do that. Okay, I'll be around if you want to know where I am. Ask Raphael. Thank you.